Hello and welcome back to Politics and Polls. I'm Julian Zelizer, a professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University, and this is my co-host and colleague, Sam. This is Sam Wong here, professor of neuroscience and molecular biology and co-founder of the Princeton Election Consortium. So too often, I think when we attempt to understand politics, we only turn to political analysts and social scientists and journalists. But I often feel that we don't do enough uh, listening to some of the people who are writing and acting and doing important things in the arts and uh, making important contributions that actually teach us a great deal about the ways in which American politics works. When you think about it, there's a huge list of books, films, and plays that most Americans instantly think of when they think of American politics, all the president's men, advise and consent, a little more recently, primary colors. Uh, we're in a period where television seems saturated with work on, on politics like House of Cards and uh, Scandal, the West Wing, and even Homeland that open up conversations about the way politics works and uh, I think have a very important role, especially in a period where so many Americans are distrustful of what goes on in Washington. So the arts, I think, are a great way to force us to think in new ways about politics and to open up questions that might otherwise be too far out of the media box or the academic box. Uh, for us to think about. So today we're really delighted and honored to have one of the most important playwrights uh, and screenwriters of the current era, Robert Schenken. Robert won the Pulitzer Prize, the Tony Award, the Writers Guild Award. He's been nominated several times for an Emmy. He's written stage, television, and film. He's the author of 14 original full-length plays, two musicals, and a number of one-act plays. He co-wrote the feature film uh, The Quiet American, and Hacksaw Ridge, a new film of his, will be opening in November. And uh, he has many television credits, and he was also an actor in Star Trek, uh, which uh, is an important uh, moment, I'm sure, in his career that will keep on going forever, uh, given the passion of those fans. And, and finally, what we're here to talk about today is his very brilliant play, starred Brian Cranston all the way, which focused on Lyndon Johnson, the Civil Rights Act of 64, and the 64 election, and was then made into a film for HBO. So, Robert, thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here. So just as a quick uh, intro for those who didn't see it uh, in either version, the, the play and the movie follows Lyndon Johnson. The first half is really about all the legislative battles that took place to pass the Civil Rights Act of 64, which ends desegregation in the South, and the work that Johnson did with civil rights leaders uh, trying to work through a series of compromises and tensions that emerged over the bill. And the second half is on the election of 64, where Johnson faced off against Barry Goldwater and ended up winning in a stunning landslide. And it's really a remarkable piece of work. I took a group of students there and they left talking to me about the discharge petition and the filibuster, <laughs> the way they might talk about sports, uh, which really, it was great. Uh, they were, were totally engaged, which I'm sure many people felt. Maybe we can start, Robert, by asking you why you chose to write uh, a play about Lyndon Johnson and his approach to politics at this particular moment in history. I grew up in Austin, Texas, uh, the Hill Country, which is, of course, Lyndon Johnson's uh, hometown and his, where he rose to power. And so he was always uh, a presence uh, in my life. My father had a, a very um, odd little personal connection with LBJ. My father was a pioneer in public television and radio. So a big shout out to your public radio fans out there. Um, he was hired by the University of Texas at Austin to come down and create the first public television and radio station really in the Southwest. And job number one was to um, first get the permission of then Senator Johnson because it would have been a direct competitor with his own uh, media empire or should I say Lady Bird's media empire because it was all in her name of course. And uh, I'm pleased to say that he not only gave his permission, but of course would go on to sign into law the bill that created the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. So in my family growing up, uh, LBJ was, uh, you know, he was one of the good ones. And uh, I remember this election, the 64 election, 
the Johnson Goldwater election vividly. It's the first one I participated in, even as a very young student, and um, got to stay up late, watch the returns come in. And in the Manichaean universe of American politics in 1964, it did seem like the triumph of light over dark. Of course, 18 months later, troop levels in Vietnam would have ratcheted up from 25,000 to 170,000. And my oldest brother would be nearing draft age. And suddenly I began to have a different feeling about LBJ. He's so he's always been in my a presence in my life, and because he was such a really remarkable, one might even say, I think with some confidence, Shakespearean character, big not only physically, but uh, big in his ambitions, big in his virtues and his vices, his successes uh, and his failures, a truly extraordinary character who who seemed stage worthy. Finally, of course, that year, the year we're talking about, November 1963 to November 1964, the so-called accidental president, is, I think, a turning point in American politics. It is the beginning of a political cycle out of which I think we are only now just emerging. Joe Califano Jr., who um, was, of course, LBJ's chief of domestic policy says, we live in the world that LBJ created. And I, I think in many ways, that is indeed the case. The political landscape of America changes in 1964. The South, which has been solidly democratic since Reconstruction, undergoes within a very short time, actually a major realignment and becomes uh, a bastion of uh, Republican support. And this is uh, almost entirely a result of the passage of the 64 and 65 Civil Rights Acts. So I think Johnson um, and this year are a kind of um, origin story, if you will, for 2016. And uh, many of the issues over which the parties uh, argue so fiercely uh, actually have their origin in 1964. So it is, uh, it's very useful as we try to peel apart these issues and personalities to go back and, and take a look at where much of this started. So going back to that time, um, talking about 1964 and 65, in this election year, people talk about realignments and about uh, changes in, um, in, in, in the, how voters deal with the Republican and Democratic parties. But 1964 and 65 was cataclysmic. And you, in, in all the way, you captured that a little, little bit when you look, when you explore the dialogue between Eastland, Russell, uh, Dirksen, Johnson, Humphrey, all these figures, these are people who are remaking the American political landscape. And so when you hear people talk now about changes, uh, when I hear you talk about 1964 and 65, that feels heroic. And I, I can't help thinking that the changes that we have now are, are pretty small changes against this big remaking of the landscape. Well, um you know, that's a, that's a really interesting idea. I think that um, whether the realignment that we're seeing uh, measures up in some sort of moral equivalent to the realignment in 1964, uh, the big change there, of course, was the enfranchisement of those who had been disenfranchised uh, since Civil War. Um, it is the, the death knell of Jim Crow. And um, the the backlash to that, to these major advances in civil rights, which include the 64 Civil Rights Bill, which was public housing, public accommodations, schools, and the 65 Voting Rights Act, and then in 68, the Housing Act. Um, the backlash to that uh, would be very adroitly capitalized upon by the Republican Party, the so-called Southern strategy. So efficiently and so quickly would that change happen that by the time Hubert Humphrey runs for election for the president in 1968, uh, I believe he only picks up one Southern state uh, in that entire election. That's a, that's a, a watershed moment. We're not going to see that uh, in this election, but, but the electoral map is changing and is changing in significant ways. First, in the South, again, uh, as we're seeing the Democratic Party claw back uh, states that it has never held for the last 50 years, Virginia, North Carolina, 
Georgia might be in play. I don't know. There's no way that Hillary will pick up Texas in this election. But, but the numbers close. but the numbers are it's close, yeah. but it's close. And um, that's that's really fascinating. But uh, what's a little unexpected is the Democratic loss in the Midwest, um, states that typically had voted uh, Democratic very reliably are not so strong this year. Is that presage? Is this just a momentary event uh, only going to be true for this election? Or does this presage something more longstanding? It's a little hard, harder to parse that out. So one thing that's similar this year compared with the time that you describe in All the Way is um, the presence of race as a topic. And this is a year when a lot of those things are present. And if one looks at the arc of political history, there's a lot of talk about political issues, states' rights and other things, and I guess that's, anyway. But it strikes me that there's this thread that begins in 1964, and if you look at year-on-year -year change, the year you're talking about is the, uh, we've talked about in this program before, the single largest rearrangement of the states in the last 50 years. 60 to 64 is just, there's nothing like it mm. in American political history. And so it feels to me like there's, there's something that in fact is, a, our year this year is, is a descendant of the time that you were writing about. Oh, I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, race is an issue, of course, has never gone away in the United States. Um, what was uh, a, a very kind of blunt conversation in 1964, the f forces of backlash or resistant became uh, more shrewd and sophisticated. And um, so discussion of race became codified you no longer talked disparagingly. Well, I'm, I'm saying all this leading up to 2016, of course, where things change. Um, but you, historically, um, you never talked disparagingly about African Americans. What you talked about instead was crime. You talked about drugs. Uh, you talked about law and order. These were all the dog whistles. Everybody understood what you were talking about. You know, this is the Willie Horton ad. And, uh, and this was very successful. This was a very successful tactic. What's interesting is that the, I think, the election of Barack Obama uh, eight years ago, which for many of us thought, uh, hopefully, uh, clearly naively, would mark a kind of major turning point in our discussion of race in this country. And uh, what it did instead, interestingly, is to provoke a much more visceral response of that latent uh, racism, which uh, the Republican Party had always um, relied upon in a way that was uh, much more overt than we had seen before. You lie, the birther movement, um, all of these things. Is he a Muslim? Uh, and you know, you would see major Republican establishment figures do this little dance of, well, I don't know that he's not a Muslim, or I'm not, I don't know where he was born, you know, uh, all of the wink and a nod. And what, what Donald Trump has done is um, tear the fig leaf away from even that kind of wink and a nod. Uh, it's no longer a dog whistle, it's a megaphone. Um, and um, what is uh, shocking and, and of course, uh, disappointing about this election is the response that that has uh, engendered. I don't think he's created this constituency. I think he's given it voice. I think he has validated the public expression of what heretofore had been uh, thought of as an indiscretion, as impolite. And he's made it possible for people to feel that is indeed okay to be racist or anti-Semitic or nativist. Well, if you look at the amount of support that Trump is likely to get, he has a minimum floor of support in polls that's around 40, 41 percent. And it seems likely that he's going to get that much. And if you go back to the 1964 election, uh, Goldwater got around that much. So going back... 38 percent, I think. Was it 30? Huh? I thought it was something I think like it that. it was certainly about comparable. And I guess, yeah. I, is it your general feeling that a major sentiment in the 1964 election was being against the Civil Rights Act? I mean, if you think about like reasons people supported Goldwater, was that, was that an explicit subject on people's minds? And maybe this is for 
Oh, I, th I, I yeah. do think it was. I don't think it was the sole issue by any means. Uh, Goldwater's brand of conservatism, you know, which uh, w was was a really hard-edged expression of the Cold War, um, which had seen its adherents and proponents ever since World War II, 1943. That was very much also a part of what Goldwater w was advocating. And today, while there is no question, there is no question that these elements are a part of the Trump demographic. Um, I believe today the Klan newspaper officially endorsed Trump. Um, oh, so he got a newspaper endorsement. That's the, <laughs> that, that's the, that's the first one. That's the first one. Uh, of course, they're behind. They're a little bit behind the eight ball because David Duke has always been in favor of Donald Trump. But but I think it it um, it would be a great mistake to uh, completely dismiss. Uh, the entirety of Trump's support as purely xenophobic, uh, nativist, racist. Um, there is, in fact, within that, a group of Americans with a legitimate set of grievances who who have been left behind economically, and who feel and who feel that they've been left behind and disparaged, and uh, their grievances are legitimate. Both parties have failed them: the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party, and. Um, and I uh, am hopeful, I certainly believe that uh, Hillary is aware of this and sees that as an issue and will move to address it legislat legislatively and promptly upon election. Let me turn to a different issue. The, when you see the play or read it and uh, watch the film, one of the issues that comes through, and, and I assume you intended this, it's a play about compromise. and. You see all the different characters wrestling with the very difficult compromises they had to make. You see Johnson uh, certainly with how to package voting rights and leaving certain things out, which he knows liberals will be angry about uh, and also angering Southerners. And you see King, who is uh, making a big compromise at the Atlantic City Convention in the summer of 64 with the deal over the Mississippi <clears throat> Freedom Delegation. Uh, it, it, it's, it's an unusual theme for a play. I mean, I think I always think of the arts as being more interested in idealism. Uh, and so it was striking. And uh, you, you have that great line, it's not about principle, it's about votes, which Johnson yells out at some point, trying to explain why he's getting rid of some stuff. Was that part of what you wanted to look at with this? And uh, how did you think about why that was something that's necessary. Uh, very much so. Very much so. The, the, the play is a, is a look at real politics, uh, you know, what Bismarck described as uh, the sausage making of politics. Part of, part of my feeling that this is necessary is that I feel like too often today, politics and politicians are just uh, routinely in a kind of knee-jerk way dismissed as without principle because they compromise, because they change their positions. And, and this is an incredibly naive uh, view of our political system. It's a representative democracy. It's a two-party system. We are not a monarchy. We are not a dictatorship. You can only legislate when you achieve a majority and it is almost impossible to achieve a majority without crossing the aisle. And for 190 years, 200 years, this was not thought of as a bad thing. Indeed, it was thought of as how you got things done. And uh, some people were better at it than others and, and they were the people you paid attention to. And it is only in the last uh, 10, 15 years in the hardening of uh, ideological positions within the parties, the diminution of both left and right wings of the parties, that you see this uh, emphasis on the ideological purity that one must never compromise, that to compromise is to violate everything. And uh, the result of that, of course, is uh, gridlock. The result is that nothing gets accomplished. And um, and the electorate gets increasingly frustrated and and increasingly comes to believe that government doesn't work and cannot work and uh, and you create this loop feedback cycle of negativity uh, about what is possible, what is practical in politics, and so the play is very much an attempt to explore 
how politics worked in 1964 in the passage of what was, I think inarguably, one of the great legislative victories of the 20th century. It did not come easily. People gave up things that really mattered to them and mattered to their constituencies. And, and some people lost their, their political careers as a result of that. To me, that is the truest expression of principle that you are willing to give up something that is dear to you in order to achieve something that is greater for the public good. And, uh, and in 1964, we saw a lot of that. But I, I wanted to make clear to an audience how painful, how challenging, how frustrating, how complicated a process that is. And uh, I think, you know, one of the greater compliments the play has received among m many compliments is, is from the political class themselves who, who feel, regardless of their ideological or, or party alliance, that, that the play gives an accurate portrayal of how things get done. I mean, it also comes through, it's funny, everyone focuses on Johnson in the play, rightly so, but it comes through with King, I think, a lot. I mean, A, with the struggle that you see between him and the various activists who are losing a lot of their confidence in him as he's making Johnson-like compromises. And then as his own personal life starts to suffer because of the FBI going after him and some of the costs he will incur for doing this. I don't know. I found that a very compelling character for this theme. Well, um, um, thank you. Um, I, I am very proud of, of what we were able to achieve in this regard. I think it's an aspect of Dr. King that uh, has not really been um, very well articulated or understood. You know, when people think of Dr. King in this country, they think of the orator, where they think of the martyr. But Dr. King was also a brilliant politician. And, and the, uh, the, the proof of his, the brilliance of his political abilities is the fact that he was able to hold together the civil rights movement for as long as he did. Because we, we talk about the civil rights movement as though it was monolithic, you know, and everybody marching under the same banner. And nothing could be further from the truth. It was very fractious composed of small groups, almost each group led by a very intense, very charismatic leader. And these men did not share power readily or easily. They had very strong convictions and very strong ideas about how things should be done, how, how progress should be made. And, and f for the longest time, Dr. King was the only person who was able to get all of these people working together. And uh, as a result of that, um, so much progress got made. But I thought the balance, I thought the, the parallels between watching Lyndon Johnson struggle with his different constituencies, you know, the Dixiecrats on the one hand, the liberal Democrats on the other, the middle of the road Republicans seeking their, uh, their own political power, um, juxtaposed against um, Dr. King struggling with the old guard civil rights movement under the NAACP and with this new emerging vibrant student-led movement, uh, SNCC, uh, Bob Moses, Stokely Carmichael, who were getting increasingly frustrated at the lack of progress and increasingly disinclined to adhere to this notion of nonviolence. And, uh, and of course, they will eventually, tragically, um, the alliance will shatter and, uh, and, and out of that will emerge the black power movement. But for that movement remained unified for as long as it did, largely by the result of the brilliance of Dr. King. One thing I noticed um, is that unlike other political dramas, and I, I won't mention them at the moment, I get this feeling repeatedly in all the way that you're using actual events and procedural maneuvers. There's this one moment when Johnson is imparting an insight about this unprecedented move to get something put on the calendar. And it just strikes me that there are many political dramas where one would not have a procedural maneuver get 
raised up to the level of high drama. But I'm, you know, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, wow, that's great, Johnson, you're brilliant. Because, you know, I just say that I spent a year working on Senate staff, uh-huh. and, uh-huh. and and I saw some of these maneuvers, and uh-huh. it just it's it was fascinating for me to see a procedural maneuver stuck in there as this moment of tension turning into, aha, Johnson's going to get that thing onto the calendar. And, and, and these played very, very effectively for an audience. They were both uh, very entertaining and, and, and educational. It was, it was fascinating to see. They totally understood because the personal stakes were so high, they understood the importance of the tactic being employed here. And it didn't matter that it was a legislative tactic. It was a stratagem that they could they could understand the importance of the stratagem and how that was going to unlock this particular problem. Right, but per- portrayed in a real way, as opposed to sometimes when political drama gets portrayed on television and in other forms of entertainment, the maneuvers don't seem all that realistic. I, ge- I guess you had the advantage of having this canvas of, of events that you could pick from and say, okay, that's a moment. I wanted to talk about the Senate just a little bit more because it strikes me that in here, Dirksen and Russell play such major roles. And you know, when you go by the Capitol and you go by the Senate office buildings, there's the Dirksen building and there's the Russell building. Do do you think that people appreciate these pretty different monumental men? And there they are next to each other, you know? Yes, no, it's, uh, yes, just as the FBI building is next to the uh, Bobby Kennedy Justice uh, (laughs) building. Uh, (laughs) Another (laughs) stark (laughs) irony. Uh, You know, I would, it's painful to say, but I would guess that the vast majority of Americans have no idea who these gentlemen were or what they did. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true from a perspective of a congressional historian. And I mean, the play is good. And I, I was surprised when I first saw it, but re- it was refreshing to see all these figures brought in. But certainly in Johnson's world, these were the giants that he had to deal with both coming to the presidency and once he was president. I want to pick up on something else that Sam was talking about with the discharge petition. But one of the things we're interested in the podcast is how people study politics. So by nature, the way the show is structured is uh, a more quantitative uh, approach, Mm -hmm. aggregating polls and seeing what you can find from that versus what a historian does, uh, looking at big trends or important stories and moments. And when I saw the play the first time, I remember as I listened, I recognized uh, some of the uh, dialogue from actual tapes that I had heard. I had just written this book on Lyndon Johnson, so it was very much on my mind. And a lot of the encounters you talk about happen. Some are in the order they happen. Some you jumble around. And you know, there's a lot of historians who get all worked up on any <laughs> move away from the record. I, lo- I love that because I think it gives you a freedom as, as an artist to uh, tell stories about politics in a way I can't when you're limited. But maybe could you talk to us a little bit about, you, you write lots of historical fic- uh, fiction or whatever you want to call your genre. You're now working on a film on the KKK mm-hmm, I yes, read about. Um, so how do you think about doing it? What's your process of putting the story together, where you have to stick to the record and where you have freedom to maneuver? Well, it's, uh, you know, I'm always very careful when I talk about my work in public to, to say up front that uh, I am not a historian and I, I'm not a, I don't make documentaries. I, I write drama um, that is often based upon historical event or set in period and, and deals with real events and real people. Um, it's not exclusively all I do, but it is very much a large part of it. So how do I, what is my approach to this? Well, I, I try to educate myself in a very serious way. I mean, I, I start off by acknowledging that I, I don't know that much about this event and that I, I need to learn. And so I, I, I dig, I cast a wide net for all the way uh, that would mean reading virtually all of the major biographies uh, about uh, LBJ and at least one biography of all the major figures that the play touches upon. There's an enormous amount of uh, newspaper articles. This is the heyday of newspapers, magazines, Time, Life, Newsweek, Look. All of that is readily available to the historian, amateur, and professional alike. Lyndon Johnson also taped uh, many of his phone calls, um, often without the knowledge and permission of um, people he was talking to. And those tapes are now available to the American public free of charge 
the University of Virginia is digitizing them, and you can you can listen to them online, and it's fascinating. You can go on and listen to Lyndon Johnson complain to Richard Russell about Vietnam, or Lyndon Johnson um, ask FBI Director uh, Hoover, "How do you tell when someone is gay?" Uh, they're pretty interesting <laughs> yeah. m material available. And then I did the best uh, I could to talk to as many people who actually knew the participants who served in the Johnson administration or who served in the press at the time or even family members uh, of the Johnson family. Uh, so a wide net, as I say. And then very quickly, I am uh, narrowing my focus down to the story I am telling and the issue uh, which lies at the heart of that story. What, why this story? What's important about it? And um, what is the what is the theme here? What is this about, really? Why this? Why am I telling this story? And everything gets filtered through that lens. If I am writing, uh, let's say, a play, uh, all the way, you know, I, I, I have a very narrow uh, field on which to operate. Uh, my audience will sit for, you know, maybe two hours. And, and then and I can't push it much, much beyond that. So what that means, of course, is that I must be incredibly selective. I'm going to leave out big chunks of things right from the beginning. And the minute you start leaving things out, well, you're altering the record. You're changing things. A and I will go on then not only to omit but to create. Uh, sometimes that means uh, using bits and pieces of real dialogue like you alluded to in an otherwise fictional scene. But more often than not, it's me writing in the voice of or creating scenes that never happened or putting people together who weren't necessarily in the same room at the same time discussing this. All of that uh, is, uh, to my way of thinking, part of the game that I play. What I cannot do and, and this is the, the one rule that I have made for myself and I, and, I, and I truly honor, is I can't have somebody say or do something that is intrinsically antithetical to who they were. That's, that's the one rule. But beyond that, as an artist who is creating art, fiction, sky's the limit. Yeah, just um, thinking about that feeling that you want to capture, both the not being antithetical to an individual but also capturing the mood, when reading this, I, when you set up all the way at the beginning, it reminded me of things that I read when I uh, read The Passage of Power by Robert Caro, mm. how Lyndon Johnson's presidency gets set up. And I went back to, and looked in the historical record. Lyndon Johnson's job approval rating in the wake of the Kennedy assassination was 80 percent, right? It was, it was a 9-11-like moment of national unity when everyone came together and was behind him. So to what extent are the, all these events, you know, people like Martin Luther King and his associates say they need to deliver 20, tens of millions of votes to Lyndon Johnson. I think at one point it's like 20 million votes. I forget what you said. But to what extent did Johnson really have the wind at his back? Like, was it, it in some sense, were these things all set in motion by the Kennedy assassination? Well, in, in many ways, yes. In many ways, yes. Uh, but it is also important to point out that, that Johnson, who was a brilliant politician, knew the opportunity he that he'd been he had handed. To do with it. He knew this would, this was a unique right. opportunity. There was a window here, and he seized it by the throat and was relentless in the pursuit of it. So it's it's like the old saw about uh, you know being lucky is twenty years of preparation and one minute of of recognition uh, that this is the moment. But it's that twenty years of preparation that counts. Well, that's true for LBJ. There's there's hardly a, a president we've had who had his legislative uh, experience and uh, skill. So he recognized that, um, that uh, this moment of unity was not going to last and he certainly, he certainly wrapped himself in the mantle of the dead president. Everything was about uh, fulfilling the legacy or honoring the legacy of President, uh, president Kennedy. And I, I think it's worth pointing out that, you know, it had taken – John F. Kennedy three plus years to finally propose a civil rights bill after all the promises he had made and then it was immediately stuck in committee and there didn't seem any chance that he would have gotten it out and I don't think he would have. I don't think he could have. I think it took a politician uh, with the legislative caliber of a Lyndon Johnson to do that. It's also important to point out that, uh, that he had a very substantial majority 
in Congress. And, uh, and after the election in 64, that margin of victory would be even greater. And that gave him a period of two years until the midterm elections in 66 where the party suffered uh, serious reversals where he really had an opportunity to make change and he did. Boy, did he make change. I mean, it's you're hard pressed to see another period in the Congress where it was so uh, successful and productive. Right. We haven't even mentioned Medicare. All right. Oh my goodness. So it's Medicare, uh, Medicaid, immigration reform, um, environmental conform, consumer reform. I mean, the, you know, there's a here's a here's a single story about uh, Johnson and and how he operated. Uh, he expected all of his staff to be available to him 24 seven. Seven, and you just there was no you had no excuse for not being available and he was one time the one time he could not reach Joe Califano Jr. It took him 12 hours he was furious by the time he got Joe on the phone he said where the hell have you been and Joe said well I my son got into the medicine cabinet and swallowed a bottle of aspirin and we've been at the hospital getting his stomach pumped out and immediately the tenor of the conversation changed. John said, oh, that's terrible. That's terrible. Is he going to be all right? And he said, yes, I think so. And John said, you know, that's, there just shouldn't, that shouldn't happen. You know, there, sh there ought to be a way to, where, where kids can't do that. And within a month, a bill was sent to Congress mandating childproof bottles, bottle caps, uh, and was passed. Uh, I mean, so from from the moment of thought, somebody ought to do something about it, to the passage of a law changing the the entire landscape uh, in this instance of consumer safety it was very very short. Imagine that happening today. It's 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 virtually impossible to envision. Schoolhouse rock. <laughs> right. I mean, we're almost out of time, but I can't leave. We can't leave without asking about the current election. So, uh, in addition to being real friends, we're Facebook friends, uh, and I've been, you know, reading. You have a lot of posts. You're clearly very invested in this election, and it comes after spending years and a lot of time in '64 uh, working on that period and working on those issues. How do you see this election? Uh, relative to this great piece of work you've done on what happened 50 years ago? Well, I, I do think it's a, it's a similar turning point. I think that uh, the uh, issues that have been brought to the, the fore here display a level of partisanship and divisiveness that we haven't seen in, in 50 years and the rhetoric is uh, is so alarming and so ugly. The forces that have been uh, unleashed as a consequence of that are not going to go away after November 8th. Um, there's going to be a lot of cleaning up to do for probably a whole generation. But it is also, I think, you know, what we're seeing is this particular version of the Republican Party uh, coming apart. The, the wheels are coming off the bus. And uh, if, if the election is as resoundingly a defeat as, as I think it will be, one can only hope that the establishment figures within the Republican Party will do some serious soul searching and, um, and really try to reconstitute uh, the Republican Party as a modern entity because we are a two-party system and, and we need two healthy parties. It's not good to just have one party in a two-party system. We need, a, we need a healthy Republican Party. We need a healthy conservative political force. That's not what we've had for the last 25 years. And Trump is the, in many ways, I think the inevitable consequence of very conscious political stratagems and tactics over the last 25 years. You could have predicted somebody like Trump, although in the, in the detail of Trump, he is unique. So I, I think it's a, it's a critical election, really significant, and, and coming at a critical time. I, I, I just want to, I don't want to leave this because I feel so strongly about it. The one question we never saw in four debates was about climate change. Here we are facing the single most important issue in the world, the planet is in peril, 
and and it never got discussed. Just I do a think a little tiny bit at one glancing moment, and the the, the, the smallest. The, yes. But yeah. given yeah, the yeah. the import of, the, of important. the issue yes. and the fact that the Republican Party is completely antithetical to the Paris Accord, in fact, does does not as a as a matter of its platform even acknowledge the idea of climate change. You know, you couldn't have two more different opinions on this critical subject. If only for that reason alone, this is a determining election. I want to uh, thank our guest, Robert Schenken, who wrote all the way. I urge you, uh, it's still being shown, the play is still being produced in different parts of the country. The film is available, I'm sure, on demand with HBO, and I'm sure it's running on HBO. Everyone who listens to this loves politics, I think. We probably don't have many people in the audience who don't like politics. <laughs> I urge you to see this and to spend time with it and to use it as a way to think about what went on, uh, what's going on, and where we're going as a country. And also make sure to see his new film, Hacksaw Ridge, which is out in theaters on November 4th. So thank you, Robert, for joining us. Thanks. Great to be here. That wraps up our episode. Thanks for joining us, and we'll be back soon on Politics and Polls. Take care, everybody. You've been listening to Politics and Polls, a podcast series about the 2016 presidential election produced by WooCast. The content discussed in this podcast is intended to be informational only. It does not represent nor reflect the views of Princeton University or the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Thank you.